Welcome to the fourth and last class of this course, which I've called The Knowledge Industry. We have been reading chapters from Jonathan Rauch's wonderful The Constitution of Knowledge, and our focus today is the two final chapters of Rauch's book. You can see the titles of those chapters on the, the first main slide there. Cancelling, first of all, and then the theme of unmuting yourself, as you can see. Let's dive straight into it. Chapter 7, yes, it is about cancel culture. Disinformation or, uh, and or trolling and cancel culture or are parts of information warfare in Rausch's view. In the, the final chapter in the, the book, uh, Rausch will observe, and I quote, as different uh, as their methods and politics may be, disinformation and coercive conformity are both forms of information warfare. Cancelers and trolls share the same goal of dominating the information space by demoralizing their targets, confusing them, isolating them, drowning them out, deplatforming them, shaming them, or overwhelming them so that they give up on pushing back. <clears throat> so, um, chapter seven about cancel culture, it, it obviously dovetails with the, uh, the chapter immediately before it about disinformation and, and trolling. So these two chapters obviously form a kind of set, chapters six and seven. If you haven't already listened to the part of my last lecture about chapter six, you could always go back to that uh, now or at the end of this class, go to 21, the 21 minute mark in that lecture, and you can hear what I have to say about Rausch on, um, on disinformation. So um, in chapter seven, Rausch combines his thoughts on cancel culture with observations about diversity, specifically intellectual or viewpoint diversity, and conformity. The story which emerges is about how we arrived at a situation in which there are not enough conservatives in university departments, which means a lack of viewpoint diversity, and even what Rausch calls the zombification of science. Alternative or non-conformist voices can be suppressed, and the few um, alternative or non-conformist voices which you come across in, in, in universities can be suppressed. Uh, Rausch goes on to argue that uh, cancel culture can take care of the few remaining detractors at universities, um, although it is mainly the chilling effect generated by such a culture which serves to create spirals of silence. In this chapter, Rausch will give examples of this phenomenon, uh, cancel culture. He'll talk about cancel culture away from universities, um, but he is especially troubled by the chilling of expression on campuses. Surprisingly, perhaps, he will draw on sources which suggest that it is students more than professors who are responsible for this shutting down of debate. And he will also point to the fact that it only takes a small number of well-organized individuals to bring about this kind of chilling of expression. Objectivity, Rausch will remind us, depends on viewpoint diversity. And the cult of safetyism, upon which cancelling is based, amounts to a series of unfounded assertions. That's my little summary of what's going to what Rausch argues in chapter seven. Let's consider all of this in depth, following this, following an alternative route through the different sections of this chapter. If I might begin with the section called, it's the unasked questions. Here Rausch draws our attention to the lack of conservative voices in university departments. As you can see, he draws on surveys by the Higher Education Research Institute, which tells us that the share of professors identifying as conservative after a long, a long decline had fallen to under 12% by, by 2017. 
as usual, do pause the video if you want to uh, to read through the entirety of the uh, the quotation. A, um, a lack of ideological diversity leads to what Rausch calls the zombification of, of science. He speaks of the zombification of science twice in this chapter, in chapter seven. The first time in the section called Spirals of Silence and Zombie Science. Uh, there he draws on uh, the scholarship of O'Connor and, um, and Wetherall. And then um, later uh, in um, It's the Unasked Questions, again, he returns to the theme of um, citing, he, re he returns to the theme citing uh, other scholars. As you can see here, he, he quotes from Clark and Weingord, who in their research found evidence of a pervasive, often unquestioned ideology they called equalitarianism. And his thoughts about the zombification of science seem to partly depend on his reading of Lee McIntyre, who concludes in his research that a good deal of social science today is unreliable due to its infection by political ideology. I do wonder if this is really so different from the viewpoint of Thomas Frank, which Jonathan and I considered during my second class. Frank speaks about how disciplines are dominated by some convention or ideology and how those who succeed are those who can apply that discipline's master narrative. I don't think it's so different to speak of the zombification of a field of society. If anything, surely it's, it's harsher in actual fact. So, in Rausch's view, there are not enough conservatives in university departments. Um, but a big concern of Rausch's is that the uh, remaining alternative voices can be um, suppressed. Cancel culture can take care of the few remaining detractors, as I suggested. In earlier chapters in this book, Rausch gives consideration to at least two respects in which one might face censure. When discussing accountability, he speaks of misconduct in an academic context. And when discussing policy design in chapter five, he discusses how big tech policy can lead to a user's being sanctioned. But in Rausch's view, cancel culture is something different. In the section called The Rise of Cancel Culture, Rausch goes into uh, actual cancellings beginning in 2014, and he discusses instances of this phenomenon in tech, journalism, and in academia. More interestingly, in the title called Khomeini Showed the Way, Rausch returns to the interesting idea that the fatwa against Salman Rushdie was the prototype of all later cancellations. Here he returns to some of the points rehearsed in connection with outline, with um, some of the, um, the, the points rehearsed in connection with online outrage in chapter five. Cancelling, as you can see, is about virtue signaling and bonding with your group, making a public show of defending sacred values against some perceived threat or impurity. Additionally, in Rausch's view, it's a bit of a lottery. As you can see, he argues that the ostensible target is not the campaign's real subject at all, but rather, rather a convenient object for a show of solidarity. <clears throat> Rausch rehearses some other points about cancel culture in the section called, Am I Canceling You Right Now? <clears throat> At this juncture, we come to one of the most valuable sections of this chapter, I'm sure. Rausch concedes that it is difficult to disentangle criticism from cancel culture. I might feel as though I am being cancelled. You might tell me that you are merely providing criticism. Rising to the challenge, Rausch explores the dividing line. Cancel culture, he argues, exhibits unmistakable features. Punitiveness, deplatforming, grandstanding, reductionism, orchestration, 
secondary boycotts and inaccuracy. We might rehearse how this uh, plays out. So, are you experiencing actual, uh, sometimes more or less guerrilla, punishment for a perceived misstep in a way that threatens your livelihood? Is it being claimed that allowing you to be heard is violence and that for safety reasons you must be silenced? Is the confrontation ad hominem and outraged? Are you being condemned in connection with just a handful of incidents or a single moment? Was the moment of confrontation at least partly discussed in advance of the confrontation? Is anyone who supports you running the risk of being subject to similar treatment? Is the case against you full of untruths and holes? If the answer to these questions is yes, you have experienced cancellation or attempted cancellation at least. That's uh, uh, Rausch's kind of anatomy of cancellation there. Such a situation would exhibit all of these different features running from punitiveness to inaccuracy. <clears throat> However, in Rausch's view, it's also the chilling effect generated by such a culture which threatens to kill off viewpoint diversity in the, in the knowledge industry. In the wonderfully titled section, You're Going to Get Your Ass in Trouble, Rausch outlines the scale of the problem on campuses. He concedes that surveying professors is challenging from a statistical point of view. But, it, but when it comes to how students feel, the evidence is clear enough, he suggests. Um, in this section, he says, as you can see, that in 2018, a Gallup poll found that 61% of students said their campus climate prevented some people from saying things they believe because others might find them offensive. Again, pause the video if you'd like to read everything that he says there. In the same section, he also provides us with an insight into where the pressure to conform is coming from. Apparently, it's coming from the students themselves. More than 60% cited the worry that other students would criticize their views as offensive, we read. Rush is citing, as you can see, a heterodox academy survey. But this um, point takes Rausch to, towards a paradox. This, this, the, you know, the, the fact that it's to do the pressure to to um, to eliminate viewpoint diversity seems to be coming more from the student body than from anywhere else. Um, this takes uh, Rausch towards a paradox as he sees it. There is no mass demand for this cancel culture. So where does it come from, and how can it possibly be so effective? It comes, argues Rausch, from organisation, or its power comes from organisation. In uh, the section called Tyranny of the Few, Rausch argues that once organised, intellectual pressure groups capture resources and influence. They impose taboos, guard sacred beliefs, dominate hiring and tenure decisions, and build administrative empires, all of which accumulate over time, distorting and calcifying the intellectual economy. All of this is utterly deplorable in Rausch's view. Much of it stems from what he and others call safetyism. As you can see, Rausch thinks of safetyism as an incredibly reg regressive and destructive idea. It silences, it makes people neurotic, it causes conflict. Um, we go from the, those facts to the facts that it um, catastrophizes everyday interactions, it, it uh, patronizes minorities and so on. So uh, Rush produces um, in this particular section a, a truly damning verdict um, about, uh, about um, safetyism. So this is the kind of ideology he thinks which lies behind these regrettable tendencies he sees. And uh, he, he, he feels that clearly at root, the, um, the idea of safety is, 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 a, is an enormous problem. Um, everything that he has talked about obviously runs count, uh, contrary to, to viewpoint diversity. 
But viewpoint diversity, he argues, is indispensable to liberal science. In the opening section of this chapter, after further lauding James Madison and his sense of the importance of pluralism in political liberalism, Rausch switches to epistemic liberalism and arrives at a parallel conclusion. Liberalism and diversity are allies, he observes, thinking, of course, mainly about viewpoint diversity. Um, and in the section titled Objectivity Comes from Diversity, um, Rausch trumpets the importance of intellectual diversity, viewing it as a sine qua non if our academic efforts are to pass muster as objective. He boldly declares that objectivity improves as a function of viewpoint multiplicity and diversity and, and diminishes as a function of viewpoint monopoly and homogeneity. So not enough conservatives in universities, not enough viewpoint diversity for that reason, the zombification of science stemming from it, the suppression of alternative or nonconformist voices, um, be it from, by, by means of cancel culture and the chilling effect generated by such a culture. On top of that, the fact that students rather than professors are responsible for this uh, climate um, on university campuses um, and the idea that the effectiveness of cancel culture comes down to the um, organisation of those who uh, practice it. So um, some of the, uh, I think a version at least of the, uh, the line of argumentation presented in this particular chapter, chapter seven. Um, so in, in chapters six and seven then, Rausch has identified the nature of a manifold problem. In particular, he has provided anatomies of the problem with disinformation and trolling on the one hand and with cancel culture on the other. What remains in the, uh, in the final chapter is to come up with uh, solutions. I'll begin with a couple of observations about the structure and mode of presentation in this final chapter. <clears throat> first, um, first structure. In the opening section uh, of this uh, final chapter, Rausch says what you can see here. The constitution of knowledge does not take care of itself. It needs a strong and positive defense. More particularly, it requires strengthening all three legs of a triadic defense, each reinforcing the other two. Members of the reality-based community need to reinforce our institutions, our solidarity and ourselves. Now, Rush goes through these three contexts in this chapter. Um, I think he squeezes his thoughts about solidarity into one section, the section called It Takes a Group to Stop a Group. It's like a single section sandwiched between two longer um, stretches. Everything prior to that section is about institutions and everything after it is about the, the individual and how the individual needs to do needs to do his or her part when it comes to defending the constitution of knowledge so that's structure um, second of all mode of presentation i remarked in my first lecture that Rausch would return to the dialogue between himself and theotetus though second time around he'd play the part of socrates when Rausch turns to the resources of the individual in this chapter what the individual can do to defend the constitution of knowledge, the dialogue between the two continues, the di dialogue between the Socratic Rausch and his imaginary student Theotetes. So in the second half of the book, Rausch has, has dealt with two manifestations of information warfare, disinformation, stroke trolling, and call out campaigns. We might expect him to provide equal amounts of analysis of his two concerns as he makes his way through the three legs of the defense. But I think it's fair to say that there is more about how to counter cancelling in this final chapter and less about the fight against disinformation stroke trolling. 
to give you a sense of how these concerns get matched with one another in this final chapter. Um, I think there is, a, there is a more or less equal balance in the section called, is the institutions stupid? There we hear about the fight against Trumpian disinformation, but also about universities safeguarding freedom of speech. In media and government, the balance is also there. We hear about how different institutions are working to build institutional barriers to both propaganda and intimidation. And in the sections where Rausch is dialoguing with Theotetis, we do hear about how to deal with right-wing trolls. By and large, Theotetis sounds like a left-of-center classical liberal who is having difficulty with an illiberal left. But in the section called The Power of Not Protesting, we do hear about how Theotetis might try to deal with a, a, an aggressive populist right. The rest of this final chapter feels like a follow-up to the previous chapter and the theme of cancel culture, however. I'd like to dedicate the rest of this lecture to simply providing an account of how Rausch provides responses to the problems he identified in chapter seven. The story which emerges in the previous chapter is first about how we have arrived at a situation in which there are not enough conservatives in university departments. In order to reverse such developments, Rausch proposes a long list of possible reforms. Um, this, as you can see, is from a section in this final chapter called Diversifying the Academy. Perhaps I can read this in, in, in full. He's speaking about how, how to sort of establish more of, a, of, a, uh, more of an equilibrium between left and right in, in uh, the university world. And he says the following. That might entail making positive efforts to recruit and hire and promote conservatives and others who challenge campus orthodoxies in their teaching and research. At a minimum, it entails identifying and eliminating discrimination and other obstacles to conservative faculty and students. It entails welcoming conservative speakers, making them safe and defending them from mobs and deplatformers. Consistently dis uh, disciplining bad actors who bully or harass people who have controversial views. Repudiating the use of ideological litmus tests like commitments to a progressive interpretation of diversity when hiring and promoting scholars and staff. Disowning emotional safety as a community value while ensuring physical safety. Ceasing to treat everyday interpersonal conflicts as triggers for administrative action and instead encouraging students and faculty to work out their disagreements face to face. Ridding campuses of speech codes and bias incident reporting systems, which chill candid conversations, using an objective reasonable person standard instead of a subjective feelings-based standard when evaluating claims of speech-related harm or harassment, banning any investigations of students and faculty members for First Amendment protected speech, absent a showing of probable cause that professional standards were violated. So uh, a very compelling and detailed list of how the, um, the political imbalance in universities can perhaps be, be addressed. Now, um, in the previous um, chapter, we heard about how alternative or non-conformist voices can be suppressed. Uh, cancel culture, taking care of the the last remaining detractors, as I said. And so nat naturally, Rausch turns to this theme in this final chapter um, as well. In the section called Countering Cancelling, he argues that employers need to equip themselves with procedures which guarantee that when a cancel campaign arrives, they have protocol in place for dealing with it, meaning that there is no knee-jerk reaction. 
Rausch begins with employment law or anti-discrimination protections before segueing to the development of countervailing social pressure on employers not to reflexively kowtow, kowtow to councillors. From, from there he turns to the most important way of organising against cancelling. Employers and companies need to internalise resistance to cancellations, especially by preparing for uh, such campaigns. You can see um, on the next two slides what he argues. And again, I think I'm going to read it in full so that you um, have a, a clear sense of what he argues in this context. Most important of all, he says, is for employers and companies to internalise resistance to cancellations, especially by preparing for attacks. In order to defend their values when a crisis hits, organisations need to identify and declare their values ahead of time. Otherwise, they panic and cave in. They can prepare by, for example, setting up internal procedures, preventing a rush to judgment against targeted employees by committing to evaluate the totality of an employee's work history and character rather than acting on the basis of a single controversial action or allegation by offering recourse and support to employees who are targeted on social media or by bullies inside the company. by promulgating guidelines for human resources and communications executives to follow when cancel campaigns boil up, and above all, by expressing a commitment to their employees off workplace speech rights. By hardening these defences, Rausch argues, organisations can make themselves more resilient if hit by cancellors and therefore less tempting as targets. And in the previous section, um, Rausch had spoken about the potency of organised groups with respect to cancel culture. His inference is that the opposition to cancelling and the chilling of expression must be at least as well organised. That takes us on to a section called It Takes a Group to Stop a Group, where the focus shifts to solidarity, as I indicated earlier. This section begins with a, a rather depressing roll call of incidents where a small, well-organised political grouping tried to get an ideology instilled in an institutional setting. Rausch returns to the need for organised resistance. As you can see, he observes that organised minorities beat disorganised majorities every time. When pressure groups meet with organised opposition, they retreat. When they do not, they advance. Still, America's civic culture can counter-organize against cancelling and coercion and is already doing so. Rush goes on uh, to, to discuss a number of uh, newish organizations that serve to exemplify the kind of thing he has in mind. He name checks Fire, Heterodox Academy, Bridge USA, Braver Angels, and goes on to, to even mention Yasha Monk's persuasion and, and the Uncancel project. So Rausch rehearses responses to the kinds of problems he discussed in chapter seven, how to achieve greater viewpoint diversity in universities, thereby killing off zombie science, and how to counter canceling and how to organize against guerrilla maneuvers on campuses and, and uh, elsewhere. Of course, I have um, I focused mainly on the sections where Rausch's focus is, is institutions and solidarity. <clears throat> As mentioned already, the long final stretch of this chapter resumes the dialogue between Rausch and Theotetes. And there the focus is on how the individual can play a part in fighting back. I want to try to summarise that wonderful um, long end section, but I'm sure you'll enjoy it enormously if you haven't already uh, read it. <clears throat> We've reached the end of this uh, wonderful book, and I'll, I'll wrap up with a few, a few closing uh, remarks. These uh, later chapters of the book, uh, or some of these later chapters, five, uh, six and seven, 
um, which are about uh, you know digital and, and disinformation and cancel culture. These are obviously very topical chapters. In contrast to say chapters three and four, where Rausch goes into the emergence of the constitution of knowledge and discusses its rules and institutions. I think the enduring relevance of chapters three and four about the constitution of knowledge, the enduring relevance of these chapters is, is beyond doubt, I, I think. In 20 years time, in 30 years time, it will be illuminating to read his thoughts on the, the constitution of knowledge. What about chapters five, six and on seven, uh, digital disinformation cancellation? In a way, it would, be, it would be nice to think that there will be no need to read these chapters in the future. I say that because in that situation, or that, that suggests a situation in which the subjects covered are no longer hot topics because the problems have been solved. Imagine a world in which the net and all the tools that come with it had been redesigned for the better, a world in which disinformation and trolling had gone into decline, and a world in which cancelling had become a thing of the past. Well, we are definitely not in that world yet. That means we need Rausch's thoughts on these subjects. His analysis can, of course, help us to make great progress in these areas. I'm delighted to have had the chance to spread the word about his wonderful contribution. This has been the first in the Liberal Bookshelf course series. Look out for the next course in the series. Keep an eye on the uh, ILV's website and on, on its X uh, feed and so on. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this course and I, I, I hope you'll, uh, you'll tune in for the next one as well. Bye for now.